Welcome to the latest video. This is an American still life after Raphael Peel. He was considered the first American still life artist. Most of the other artists up until that time were European. He was one of 18 children. His father was Charles Wilson Peel, and Charles Wilson Peel actually started the Philadelphia Museum. He had 18 children with many different wives. My personal favorite thing is that five of the sons were named after artists such as Titian and Rembrandt, Raphael, a few more. But Raphael Peel actually had the uh, a great deal of influence because, again, he was considered the first of the American still life artists. So let's go ahead and, and get started painting this particular still life. Transfer on the design, read through the instructions, and let's get started. As you can see, I just as I instructed, I had the design transferred on, and we are going to start with the background and the foreground and get that placed in. As you can see off to the side, I have my, my colors mixed. And you'll have in your instructions, you'll have all of the information on mixing the colors, whether you're using traditional oils or, or the Genesis. One advantage of the Genesis, and I can tell you, you can do this painting in oils, acrylics, colored pencil, as long as you know your, your medium. But one advantage of the Genesis is that these are mixed up, and I used old palettes because of course the paint never dries. But another thing is that I'm not sure how often I'll be able to, to work on this painting. Maybe I'll get it finished today. Maybe it'll be tomorrow, or maybe it'll be in a couple of weeks. I hope not, but I'm planning on trying to get this done fairly quickly, but I don't have a concern about all of my work going to waste in terms of mixing, because it's going to just be there waiting for me. So as you can see, I am painting carefully around the still life objects, painting over the, the glass that I transferred on. I did want to know where it was, but I am painting over the glass because we want it to, to appear transparent. Our light on this particular piece is coming in from the left, therefore it's dark on this side, on the left side, even though the light's coming in from that direction, it's going to get lighter over on the right side. Light travels in a straight path, therefore it's going to be darker on the right. Plus just much more exciting to have dark against the light and light against the dark. Plus it's just actually how light would would uh, affect the background. Think of the background as a big cube. Picking up a little bit lighter color. I did dress my brush a little bit in some paint thinner. You can use Turp, you can use Mona Lisa paint thin, thinner, whatever you use to make your paint a little bit looser. I'm using a Sable Tech. I like these for this loose canvas work because, as you can hear, maybe you can't, but trust me, it's loud on the canvas. And what that says is that a lot of friction and pressure and it's kind of rough. So to use one of my nice Kingsland brushes or a Majestic, it would be a little too rough on those brushes. You can use them. They just won't last as long as they should. I'm going to take off 
this piece of tape and realize that I needed to come down a little bit lower, but I can do that easily enough. What we want also is we just want this background to melt into the foreground or vice versa. I've been studying a little bit about um, Da Vinci. I actually have a um, art history minor. And one thing that Leonardo brought to the table was that idea of um, sfumato and chiaroscuro. And the chiaroscuro, what that is referring to is how our eyes actually work. That as things get farther away from us, they're a little blurred. We can't see the distinction. And that was something that he really uh, studied and tried to replicate in his artwork was that as things get farther away from us, we can't see distinct edges. And we also refer to that as uh, lost and found edges. So that's the, that idea of losing this back edge into the background. We know it's there. We just don't have to be so blatant about it. However, on this side, I would like it to be a little bit more apparent because it's on the side of the light. But not much. Light is coming in from the left, not using any turp, and getting this very light foreground in. Might have to paint it twice. Again, letting it blend into that wet background. where I'm always glad the tape is here because you know a few of the rules with still life is that you know table lines etc have to be straight and so putting the tape down and and making sure that it's straight is a it's a good idea I'm going to work in the shadows right into this wet into wet so in some areas I'm I'm painting over where the shadows will be but I'm also not putting down as much paint. Always setting my brush down first where I want the most amount of paint to be, and then moving to a, an area where it doesn't have to be as solid. I'm trying to get everything going at a at a horizontal. You know, if you have brush strokes, if they're parallel to the bottom of your surface, then that's okay. I'm gonna put in the thickness. I don't want to call attention to this edge per se, so I'm going to give that a little bit of a blend. And if it gets too blended out or diffused, you can go back and make it crisp again, but it's, it's kind of tricky to make a line blended or soft or uncrisp, if that's a word, after it's dry. So I have a go on the side of ever so slightly blended. Let's 
strengthening back in there just a smidge. Now I'm going to switch to a slightly smaller brush to put in the start of the shadows. And up at the top here I have some black, so I think I'll I'll use that. And then, okay, so this is just the start of the shadows. Shadows have very soft and blended edges, so this will make sure that that happens. This is kind of an interesting shadow. This is the shadow from the, the glass. And then put in the shadow from the plate. The shadow from the glass I'm going to leave pretty diffused. The only thing that casts shadows with glass is it's just the thickness of the glass that will cast a shadow. So it's not going to be as sharp and prominent as from the solid objects. I'll blend these down again. This idea that shadows are transparent, we can get them started here and strengthen them. And it's those layers and layers and layers that make things look realistic. Okay, I'm going to give this a quick check. It looks like painted relatively carefully around everything. Strengthen this light one more time. I think I've apparently given up on being careful around leaves. You want something to look as if it is in the distance. It should be soft, diffused. If you want it to look like it's closer to us, then you make it crisp. So I think I'll crisp this up. And that's in some regard what I was referring to with Da Vinci when he talked about the sfumato. As if you're seeing everything, especially you know, more so in a landscape, you're seeing things through layers of atmosphere. And so things get grayer and they blur. And that's also because of the way our eyes work. So it's a combination of atmosphere and that as things get farther away, we can't, we can't see them as, as clearly. All right. Background stage one is in. We need to dry this or um, let it dry depending on what you are working with. Then we'll move on to painting the actual objects. 
I'm going to start with the piece of fruit all the way over on this left side. As you can tell, I have my colors mixed and I'm switching to a, a Kingsland 12 uh, filbert. Absolutely no thinner for this uh, part. We want obviously our still life objects to be quite uh, solid in appearance. Notice that I'm loading both sides of my brush, and then I'm laying it flat to get the most uh, use out of my loading of the paint. So for example, if I was up on the tip, not as much paint. This is, you know, quite a bit of paint and it's you know, a pretty efficient way uh, to paint something. So this is my mid value. This is a color that I perceive as the color of this uh, apple. I'm dropping down to the first dark. I'll put a little bit of this in the center. This left side, even though our light is coming in from the left, this left side is going to be dark to help it roll back, advancing and receding edges. So this is a, a receding edge. I am going up on the tip to create that crisp outside edge, which will blur and, and maybe lose a little bit later, but we want it to be neat in appearance. And of course, this piece of fruit is uh, round. But it doesn't have to be perfectly round because, of course, on the tree it rests against branch or other things and flattens out. I do have a little goob right there that I'm going to try to. This is my nature. I have to get it off now. Just a, just a Q-tip. But coming in and filling this in with the dark. Now, if I weren't filming, I might be flipping this around. So if you find your arm at kind of the awkward angle that I have here, that's when you want to turn things a little bit. And I'm going to drop down to the darkest value. A lot of purple in this particular color value and so I want to be sure that it doesn't touch the mid value because there's you know a fair amount of of yellow in that mid value and they're not exactly friendly with each other. Pick up a little bit of dark to help create that transition. I made the space for the dark value, maybe just a little, a little too large. I also want to clean out where the highlight is going to be. I could have left it, but sometimes with blending, it's just easier to, to clean it out later. So now I'm going to go in with my light value. A little bit of light over on this side as well. Jumped over and picked up some of a little bit 
lighter and brighter color. The light's coming in from the upper left, so that's why the lightest is in that area. And of course, this is all just uh, stage one, and so it's not going to be as, as dark as we need it yet. Let's see if I can deepen the, the indentation just a little bit. I think that's going to be good enough for stage one on our apple. Let's move on and do a little um, bit of work on the glass. I have my brush loaded with black that has a little bit of um, thinning medium in it just to help it move. I'm putting in the dark, which is going to make this glass shine. It's interesting. I'm on a light section, therefore, I'm going to put in some dark values. And when I go up to the dark section of the composite composition, I will only add just light values. What I'm adding is some of the thickness of the glass and how glass when it's on an area, it makes what's back behind a little bit darker. In some ways, it's constructing the glass. In some ways, it's adding that interesting distortion that we see with glass. Add the center to make this a little bit darker. If you've painted water drops, this should seem familiar, how the middle of water drops is a little bit darker. Let me come in with some orange in color. Maybe you can tell I picked up the mid value from this apple. It's really a great way to define to glass through color rather than just black and, and warm white. Try to find ways to define edges with reflected light or reflected color. I'm using just a small round. You know this is a below eye level still life because we can see this elliptical shape. We can see this ellipse and this one as well. And an ellipse by definition is just a circle that's been foreshortened. You're just seeing it in in perspective. I think it's interesting just adding those few things already as we begin to make it look like glass. We don't have to be really blatant about defining glass. Our, our brain always wants to help us. a little bit with some warm white. These are the glints 
that are bouncing off. I am ending up with a you know a few graphite lines showing, but I'm not gonna worry about that because I can erase this when it's the graphite when it's dry. always makes a shine look more realistic is by having pretty diffused edges and then coming back in the middle and adding a glint. It's gotten a little murky in here, so I'm going to come back in with a little bit of the table color. And I guess I could, since it's still very wet, I could probably just come in and, and wipe it out, but I have that paint mixed up, I might as well use it. Okay, I think I do want to define these walls a little bit more. And then one thing I'll definitely check is that there's symmetry, meaning that this glass ends up being the same on both sides. And if it's not, I will fix. A little bit of warm white, can't let it go to waste. Okay, let's move on to the big yellow apple. I'm going to start with the light section just because I want to be sure that it holds. I like that you know this was prepped with a really dark color because it's it helps in the dark areas but of course it totally negates the light areas. It's interesting you put this on and whoa is that light on this dark background and I always think oh man that's gonna be too light but the more that's put on I'm kind of doing a, a brush mix between these two because this this is very very light 
But the more that you put on, the less it looks uh, like a spotlight. So adding casually or carefully, depending on your personality, there's all kinds of things inside of the bowl. And so I'm carefully painting around those. I'm going to drop down to the, the dark value. And as always, on our other round fruit, we have to have the side on the light a little bit darker just to help it roll back. Start adding the dark across the back of the piece of fruit. In other words, all outside edges. And then it starts to get fairly dark over on this right side. And I'm being a little bit casual and letting my brush jump, jump around a bit because the surface of fruit is not, is not perfect. And this is what I thought was going to be as dark as I needed to be. And it's, I, I think I could be a little bit darker, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump over here. This is for a different object, obviously, but I can pick it up and use it because it's in the same color family and it's a little bit darker and duller. I'm not feeling like it's cool enough, so I'm going to grab a smidge of this purple because that will will cool it. So one thing we haven't talked about in a still life, it gets darker and duller and cooler. So that's going to help this dark side all the way to the left, roll back. Then we do have the little stem area. Always start off with my colors so neat and then a lot of brush mixing because it can look great on your palette and terrible on your painting. I'm going to make this area darker. So, this is where the graphite line used to be. Then the inside could be a little bit lighter to show that path of light. And I'm thinking, well, jazz up that highlight. It's just not going to hold. But I'm kind of excited because I can 
add a few glimmers onto the side of the glass in this yellowish color. course I'm going to just look to see if there's any place else that a little bit of yellow would be productive. It seems like most of it is that beautiful orange color which I think is disappearing. Easily added. Okay I think it's time to do the the little pastry that's off to the side. So let's go ahead and add that. I'm going to start on the little pastry off to the side. I've picked up a, a smallish flat brush to use. Analyzing this painting, I thought, you know, it's really clever the way that the green travels throughout the composition. We're going to put little green like sparkles of sugar, I guess, on top, and that will get green over on the side of the composition or, you know, continue it. I'm not blending this super, super smooth. I'm trying to keep it a little bit rough just to give it the, the texture. Placing in that darker value. I say that and I had to go get the darker value, but Placing some darker value on the side of the light to roll that back. I always feel redundant, but think advancing and receding edges. If it's coming toward us, like right in here, this is what's coming out toward us the most. It's going to, going to be a lighter value than what's next to it. If it's moving away from us, such as this side, and especially this side, darker values. And again, blending through a little bit of pouncing to retain that, that texture. Now, picking up basically warm white. Placing on what appears to be frosting. Trying to let it look like it's cascading down the side a little bit. And that can be added later as well. Now, the top of this will paint as if, well, we're going to approach it as if it were a flat plane, because that's what it is. It might be round in nature, but actually it has more in common with the top of the table um, cube shape. So it's going to be very similar to this was light and then it gradated and got darker as we moved back. That's what I'm attempting to do here as well. So I have it light where it's hitting that, that leading edge where the light's striking the leading edge. Now I'm going to get progressively darker and I'm just picking up some of the background darker value. Picking up some of the background to make it a darker value because it's really, you know, in the grand scheme of things, not all that dark, but it is darker than what is next to it.
in this because it's icing or frosting. Should be blended smoother. I think I'm going to try to see if I can get this to hold. There's our little pastry or cake. I think I'm going to add in a few leaves, the ones that are not totally obstructed by uh, my sloppy painting, but I think I can, I'll be able to do it. I like this very dark leaf juxtaposed against this very light fruit. And this is, I don't know, to me this is where my eye goes, right in here. And so having this kind of exciting value up against one another does cause your eye to, to look in this area. I've put down the, the dark value, trying to get a little bit of a value change through the middle. Not really holding. Let it sit for a little bit. Might have to add some more yellow. I'll just go ahead and do that underneath. And there might end up being some sort of dried fruit over the top of that, but that at least helps um, finish off that leaf to a certain extent. This is a really great profile leaf. I think in studying the Peel family, they were botanists, and they actually, and I, I think you can tell, I mean, this is very uh, observed fruit and leaves. In other words, not painting from their imagination. But they actually brought the first geranium to the United States. Okay, that has a really great edge on it. I don't know if it'll hold, but I'll give it a try. It gives it that appearance that we're seeing this leaf in profile. Get that, that idea started. I have all this light on my brush. I know that I want this leaf to be pretty light to give it the illusion that it's bending over the top of a plate that we haven't painted yet. Still can't get that to do anything. I placed some light value. Now some dark on both sides to curl that back. And with these leaves, it's kind of just deciding which leaf is coming toward us, which section is coming toward us the most. And that's where you're going to place in these very, very light values. As you can tell, I'm somewhat starting to production line.
you make an edge or a section dark, it's going to recede into that dark background. You make a section light, it's going to recede. Or it's going to uh, come into our space. The main difference on that, however, might be like this particular leaf, which I still want to make it a little bit darker. It has to be dark to pop it away from the yellow fruit. So you just want to go opposite of what's back behind. It's light, and you want it to come forward. Make the leaf overall dark. The background is really dark, what's behind it. And then that's when you get lighter to bring it forward. It is just separate things think contrast. placing values just where I see them on the reference material. In some cases I can't see my drawing any longer. So if it looks like I'm thinking with my brush that's what I'm up to. Checking to see if I have I've forgotten any any leaves. I think this is a great just blocking in. Still want this one to be darker. I guess I'll have to just pick up some black. Because again, that's the only way we're gonna be able to see that leaf is if it's super dark. Next to that very, very light apple. All right. I would like to dry this, but I think I could get in this plate. So I'm coming in with gray and just placing this plate in. Like I said, there's all kinds of dried fruit. So, it's a little bit of blocking out. That will help us in just a moment. I could switch to a, a liner here. I have a tendency when I get a brush in my hand and it's not horrible, I just stick with it. This one is kind of reaching to the going to horrible just because it's doesn't have the greatest chisel edge. 
my idea is to just find the, the edge on that plate just a smidge. I always think I can draw better, I'm grabbing the brush here, I can draw better with paint than I can with anything else, so that's why I kind of get this in, rather than trying to transfer it back. Everything on here at this point is pretty wet, so this wouldn't be a a bad time to either let this dry or uh, if you're working in Genesis to dry it, but we can move on with the next stage. Just a little bit of of cleanup of the edge of that plate. So let's go ahead and dry this and then uh, we can go on to stage two. As you can see, I'm giving everything just a, well, everything meaning two pieces of fruit, just a quick second coat. Just doesn't look solid. It looks a little bit see-through. I'm not a big fan of giving things a, a, a double coating, but if it looks like poor craftsmanship, then I think it's, it's warranted. Sometimes if you double paint things, what ends up happening is it looks very hard and, and stiff. So I am trying to have slightly loose brushwork so that what's underneath glows through. But I wanted to show you this because it, you know, it really is a, a relatively fast process. And I think I'm just going to double paint the two pieces of fruit. I think the other objects are, are solid enough, and of course, our glass is transparent, so we don't need to. Give that another coat. Making sure that I'm respecting that curve that we have to see on the apple. I double painted the reddish apple already. It was just that same idea. I dropped to a smaller brush to um, blend in the, the yellow. I think giving this that second coat is, is going to just make our shine process just that much easier because it'll be nice and solid underneath. I'm going to double check the 
edges on these leaves. I got a little, a little wild, I think. Clean those up just a smidge. I think because now of this double painting, this will have to be uh, dried again. So I think this wouldn't be a bad time to put in the little pieces of dried fruit. They kind of look like raisins. Taking the darkest color from the pastry and just dropping these in. I think it's kind of neat about these is it kind of reminds me of the glass in an odd way that they they're just pretty much defined just by the little glints. I think I'll shade just a bit. While I have this on my brush, I'm going to put in the branch. You could theoretically just draw this in with a, a liner, but I like using a small brush and just coaxing it along. Then it ends up with those little knobs that branches have. You can have irregular but neat outside edges. Since this is dry, work a little bit on those interesting irregular outside edges. up a little bit of the green and a fairly dry brush for this but almost scribbling scumbling on the the decoration that's on top of this pastry
it's best to use colors from within your composition. So as you can see, I worked with my greens. And now for the little bit of color in the middle, just picked up some of that apple color. I would like these to still be a little less apparent. So I'm going to come in with a Q tip. All right, let's uh, dry all of this again, and then I think we're ready for our final stages. Yeah. Add the final shines and shadows, and let me say final, see where we're at. But theoretically, everything is ready for the final. We have form, we have details such as the decoration on the pastry, we have the details such as stems, and so it's time for the final touches which are shines and shadows. We did have a little bit of adjustment. That's always a step that can be in there, and our adjustments were uh, the double painting just to make everything a little bit more solid. So I'm coming in with warm white. This is where you paint the highlight. The highlight is a reflection of the light source. It is where the light is striking the object directly. Again, the light from the upper left says that every shine will be in the upper left of each object. It should be contained within the original light area. I'm also going to continue to build this yellow. I think is a combination of natural coloration and the light traveling. I think I would like to add just a little bit of red. As a blush tone. Just to add a little bit of life. I think that little bit of red. I'll do the same over here. Highlight on the stem. Coming in with warm white, and that's white that has just a very small amount of yellow in it.
it's definitely making this look a little shinier, more like frosting. I like, you know, the tilt that is there definitely gives it a little bit of a, of a lift. I don't think I'll start off with warm white here just because it, I don't want it to appear shiny. So I think I'm going to give it a, just a whisper of an essence of a raw sienna. And then I can put a shine in it and it will stay a dull shine versus a shiny shine like we would see on on the fruit. So all these, these very thin layers and then going back at the end with slightly opaque paint that gives us the old world look. The lost edges, the found edges, the chiral squirrel that we talked about earlier. Bringing up the branch. Add in a little texture, but I don't necessarily want it to be warm white. That branch would not be that shiny. Then the little pieces of dried fruit. Branch a little bit here. These are just few little glints of light to find texture or a wrinkle on the dried fruit. We don't want to do too much because it's definitely in the in the background. It's not even the background, but maybe the shadow of everything else. So we don't want to get too too involved. Here's where we can Add the reflected color from our objects. Just love that idea that you can just add a few strategically placed glints of light and end up with something that looks like glass. I'm waiting to use this kind of chartreuse green color. It's great in very small measures, obviously. I 
is where we can find the edge of things. It's so interesting to paint things, let them fade into the background, and then just find the areas that you want to call attention to. I like how this looks for the light values. Let's now add our strong darks. Before I do that, however, I'm going to lighten up this edge just a tiny bit. that path of light and a little bit of light in front of the objects We'll also make our shadows a little bit more realistic because what a shadow is is light being interrupted. So if you put a little bit of a lighter value right in front of where the shadow will be, it will kind of drive that point home that light has been interrupted. Okay, now I think we can. Place our shadows. I gave the background another quick coat of the background color, just the same, because it looked, I don't know, after the shines got in, it looked, just looked a little, kind of a little on the wimpy side. So I decided to just give it another quick coat. So, you know, that's something that you'll have to analyze as well. Coming in with with black that has just a very small amount of thinning medium in it to help the the paint move, and I'm basically going back over the shadows that we laid in when we put in the uh, the background. I'm also getting quite dark back in the back sections of this plate. What's interesting with if you want to make something look really shiny, sometimes don't worry about the light, worry about the dark. So I want this plate to look shiny and metallic, therefore I'm going to make the darks darker. knocking down those unidentified pieces of 
food, which I think we'll agree that's probably like a raisin of some sort. Notice that the shadows go up onto the objects. I'm trying to take some of the shadow color and put it up onto the bottom. This little cake. I'm going to do shadows in addition to shadows fall opposite of the light source. They go up onto the object that's causing the shadow, they have to be transparent. So I am very conscious that the brush that I'm using is free of other paint. It has no white in it, it has nothing in it, otherwise it'll make your shadows appear milky. And we do not want that. I'm also working a little bit on increasing the darks on these leaves. It's so interesting that they appear dark enough and then put something else in. And now they don't dark enough. So it might not have anything to do with shadow work. This has to do with continuing to analyze and do what needs to be done. You can soften out these shadows with your finger. You can soften them out with um, a mop. Kind of like to use Q-tips because I know that they're always clean. Well, sort of, depending on if I've used it before. But that's kind of a problem at times with Genesis is that the brushes, I don't get them as clean as I should or have to because it doesn't matter because the paint's not going to dry. So a lot of times I just use Q-tips to do anything that is for softening or scrubbing. The shadow on the underside of this plate comes out quite a bit because of the overhang. So I came back and reestablished that a little bit. Strengthening the inside darks again. It's one little value change. So interesting because it will just add a, so much to that illusion appearance. I'm still just working with with black. This apple here to four has looked like it was floating, and I think that gets somewhat resolved by putting some of the, the dark on the on the apple itself.
I love this process that you can handle one thing at a time. So we handled form, which is foremost, then details, some adjustments, shines, and now finally the shadow work. Each layer is, is dry, and so it there's no danger of losing what the work that you've done. So that's always, always exciting and a plus. Because then you can experiment. And if it works out, then there you go. And if it doesn't work out, then you just take it off. I'm going to find this branch again. One thing we didn't talk about is texture. And when you start on the shines, you have to think texture. And so that's why the shine that I'm placing on the stem, I'm trying to be kind of erratic with it because it shows the, the nature of the stem. Whereas almost all of our other shines have been just quite smooth because everything has been on the smooth side. So I think that we're coming to the end. I probably will let this rest for a little bit and see if there's anything else that could be added that would enhance. I hope that you've enjoyed exploring Raphael Peel. And my suggestion to you with your piece is put this away for a little bit and then come back and, and take a look at it. And then after you've decided there's nothing more productive to do, varnish it and you have a new masterpiece to display proudly. See you next time. <laughs>